from a distance. The power of perception and perspective. How often do we utilize that power? Have you ever done that in your life where you've looked back and from a distance, you can see a pattern, you can see a plan. From a distance, things seem to make sense. But in the meantime, they don't. Ever had that happen? In the Daily Word today, it says... Is the part. I breathe deeply and relax into the realization that an entire plan may not be revealed to me all at once. Life is a process and I am progressing day by day. Can we breathe into that for our own lives? And can we breathe into that for the collective? Something happens, does it not, when we see life from a distance? We seem to step out of the world of duality and into the world of presencing. And there's another way that can happen. That can happen rather than stepping out from a distance, it can happen from stepping in, stepping in so deeply that you are in the present moment, period. Right here, right now, only in this moment. And that is another space, no? where full peace exists in this present moment, no matter what an individual is going through, no matter what's happening around us, if we can practice the present moment, we have another window into pure presence, breathing right here and right now. Where we get all jacked up is in between. That's where the human condition comes in and we start to struggle, we start to fight, we start to create This moment as an enemy, Eckhart Tolle talks about that. He talks about letting go of this moment being an enemy. And sometimes we can do that by utilizing the power of our perception and the power of our perspective. But how often do we actually use that as if it's a power that is available to us? We can use that power to seek understanding. We can use that power to seek grounding. We can use that power to seek peace. And we use it by stepping in to the perspective of looking at our lives, at the times, from a distance, or right here in this present moment. And from those spaces, then bring an awareness, bring mindfulness to everything in between. Fully embracing our divine inheritance and also fully honoring and accepting our human condition. Marianne Williamson says, the times in which we live call for a critical reevaluation of our relationship to life all around us. She goes on to say, in order to transform our current challenges, we must address them from a holistic perspective, recognizing not only the external but also the internal dimensions of both our problems and our solutions. The great Martin Luther King said, somewhere we must come to see that human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless effort and the persistent work of dedicated individuals. And he said that, I believe, as a man who knew how to be in this moment in the presence so fully that he could embody his core of courage and peace and strength and love and godness and could also hold the peace and the space of how we can see life from a distance and the grounding and the centering that that can bring to everything in between. And he led from there, he taught from there, as did the master teacher lead from there and teach from there. Teach from a presence of mind, peace, be still. So will we utilize that power? Will we learn how to use the power that we have? Eric Butterworth says, our greatest need is to get in tune with the upward progressive sweep of life from within. The upward progressive sweep of life from within. So what gets in the way? 
What gets in the way of that upward sweep of life and of being in the presence, of being in our grounded, centered self? Fear, no doubt, right? And certainly, seeing anything in our lives, anything in our relationships that we may have, anything in a circumstance that we may feel not empowered to change, anything in an event that occurs in our lives, in our families, or in our world, where we question the good, where we question the plan. So how can we use our spiritual principles and our spiritual practices to get grounded in those moments? We can look at what happens to make those moments a problem. We treat those moments sometimes like an enemy. I have a family member who was talking to me recently about some prayers they've been working on and um, some activation of some deepening in relationships and praying for a deepening uh, of a, a special relationship that they have and really holding that it moves beyond some just you know superficial levels into some depth, some, some real depth that you can feel. And We've been connecting on this, and as we have this person's partner started going through some things, going through some things that really challenged their being, really challenged their peace of mind, really challenged the foundation on which they stand. And as that challenge was happening, this family member got a little nervous, you know, and was like, I don't know what's going on and I want to fix this. How do I fix this and make this better? How do I stop this problem from happening? How do I stop this seeming crumbling, this seeming falling apart? This is, you know, this is not what I'm used to. This is not what feels safe. And we were able to presence the conversation and presence the possibility that this is part of the answer to that burst of desire that says, let us go deeper. Let us go deeper. And that in fact, maybe by not wishing away this crumbling and instead saying, could this be? Could this be? Could this be? the beginning of what is going to lead to deeper conversations, deeper intimacy, deeper connection, deeper wholeness, because someone is diving more deeply into themselves. Things aren't making sense. Things are getting ruffled and rustled around. And so one has to go to the core of their being to create a new foundation, a foundation that is deeper, that is stronger, that is more substantial than was ever there before. And could there be a possibility that we are in the midst of answered prayer. That even though it seems like we are in the midst of a falling apart, that we are in the midst of creating a depth. Perception, perspective. One tells us, oh no, I don't want this. This isn't the thing that I was asking for. I was actually asking for this, and I thought it would come in this package, and this is what it's supposed to look like. And I'd like to get rid of this thing as fast as possible. Hmm. There's many people, all of us certainly, in some degree or another, who have had a life experience that was not what we planned. And that if we had a magic wand, we would wish it away. The spiritual practitioner stands in the midst of that experience and says, I demand to see the good in this and says, this too shall bless me. When Jacob wrestled with the angels, which represents God, God and divine ideas, when Jacob wrestled with the angel, he said, I will not let go until you bless me. I will not let go until you bless me. Can you imagine a human individual saying that to the grand overall design, the grand overall consciousness, saying, I will not let go of whatever it is that is in front of me or within me or among us. I will not let go until you bless me. 
until through my eyes, through my standing, through the practice of my power and my principle, through the love that I am, until I see this right. And through seeing it right, I set it right. Through having divine understanding, I call to me the circumstances that unfold the good. Sometimes it's hard to see those good points, those good moments. And in those times, there is no shame in saying, sweet spirit, I can't see it now, but because I can't see it, I am called to be it. Because I can't see it, I am called to be it. And call forth from the core of our being all the highest qualities, the highest capabilities of love, of wisdom, of divine understanding, and to stand in them and to become them so we are not mm, having an interaction with an environment or a self that is separ separated and fragmented, but that we actually recognize that we are part of a woven fabric and that this power that we've been endowed with is co-creative, is co-creative. That our lives and our world don't happen to us, they happen through us. And in fact, it's our job, our divine birthright, our honor to show up for that job. There was a talk that Martin Luther King gave on November 17th, 1957. It was called Love Your Enemies. That was what, 60 years ago? Over 1957, 60 years ago. Love Your Enemies. If anyone has heard of um, the Jesus Seminar, the Jesus Seminar is a bunch of fellows who got together, a bunch of um, scholars who took on the challenge of looking at um, the words in scripture, and looking at them to find out, based on some scholarly analysis, what most likely could be attributed to the historical Jesus. So they went on a quest for the historical Jesus, and it started with 30 scholars and um, ended with over 200 professionally trained specialists who looked at the various phrases of Jesus. The seminar classified the words and attributed certain ones being like a high degree of possibility and probability, those were the words of Jesus. And then went through and to analyze and said there were some that were um, somewhat likely to be authentic, some somewhat unlikely, and then everything that was still in black, it went red, pink, gray, and black, and everything that was in black was unlikely, unlikely to be the words of the master teacher. And they came up with the um, numbers that about 18% of the sayings and 16% of the deeds attributed to Jesus in the Gospels were authentic. And if you dive into the Jesus Seminar material, it's pretty fascinating. They analyzed it the way, you know, if you might take five of us and listen to our language, you, you would probably notice if we kept talking for quite some time, you could probably identify my voice in the crowd. So if you, without seeing, and if all the voices were exactly the same, you heard the talks of five different unity leaders, you could probably, by now, figure out which one was mine, no? So they did the same thing. And also taking into account that for history to move language and phrases forward um, for so many years, there would probably, they would probably have to be pretty short, and there was probably a, you know, a kind of pattern to them, a pattern to the languaging and a pattern to the type of um, speaking. And so in this talk from Martin Luther King on Love Your Enemies, he bases it on one of the red sayings of the master teacher, one that is most likely very much something that the master teacher would have said. And Martin Luther King says this. In referencing the Gospel of Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, ye have heard that it has been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you, 
that ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. So ye may be, to do this so that ye may be the emanation of the source that is in pure consciousness, that is in unity consciousness with love. So practice this practice so that you may show up in that way in love, that you may be the love and become the love. Now, it's a little curious and interesting to say that it doesn't ha say don't have enemies. That's a little curious. It doesn't say don't have enemies. It says love them. And it doesn't say love what they do. It doesn't say if something happens in your life that you think is awful, love that thing, though that might be another piece of a practice that's later on. But it starts with saying, love that enemy. And I want to expand that concept here for whatever it is that is on your heart today that you or I might be treating in our lives or in our world as an enemy. This is not a simple or light practice. And it may be anything for you today. It may be a health condition, a cancer. It may be something going on in the world. There's a lot to choose from, isn't there? It may be something going on in your own personal life. It may be a relationship. It may be something that happened in your family. Can I stand in it and say, this too shall bless me? Can I stand in it and say, this too I will bless? I will utilize my power to bless and I will bless this. Relationship, personal experience, circumstance, situation. Martin Luther King goes on to say, certainly these are great words, words lifted to cosmic proportions. And over the centuries, many persons have argued that this is an extremely difficult command, he says. Many would go so far as to say that it just isn't possible to move out into the actual practice of this glorious command. I think that's one of the reasons that it doesn't say, don't have any enemies. It says, love them. There's a little honoring of the human condition. Has anyone worked with their human condition lately? <laughs> worked with it to such a degree that you are able to presence all sorts of emotions, all sorts of beauty, and all sorts of ugliness, and recognize, oh, sweet one, that's your human condition. Oh, sweet one, that's your human condition. Where is the spiritual practice? But to not resist it, to not hate it, that it's okay, the mind will do what the mind will do, no? Has anyone tried to control their dreams? Has anyone had some dreams they thought, I shouldn't be dreaming that, what was that? What? Ah. Who would think of that? Anyone had a war dream where you thought of just awful things or some scary, and you think, ah, whatever it is. And then you try not to have one the next night? Good luck. You get, you get even better, the mind gets even friskier. We don't need to wrestle with the mind and the human condition. We simply need to presence it, allow it to be. So he goes on to say, they would go on to say, this is just additional proof that Jesus was an impractical idealist who never quite came down to earth. So the arguments abound. But far from being an impractical idealist, Jesus has become the practical realist. The words of this text, Martin Luther King says, glitter in our eyes with a new urgency. Far from being the pious injunction of a utopian dreamer, this command is an absolute necessity for the survival of our civilization. Yes, it is love that will save our world and our civilization. Love even for our enemies. Now, it doesn't say it's easy. And it doesn't say it's going to happen to us. But we all know the power of our practice. We all know the power of stepping in 
to a moment where we say, align me with wisdom, align my intuition with light, align my being with love, be in me the power to harmonize and to transmute negativity, be in me the power to awaken and deepen my practice in each moment of opportunity that is available to me. And friends, there is so much intelligence available today, is there not? There is so much love available today, is there not? So much love. There is so much desire for change today, is there not? So much opportunity to create, is there not? And there is so much creativity. So can we get excited about this calling? Can we get excited about the deepening of our practice? I think we can if we take on the call. Martin Luther King goes on to say, now let me hasten to say that Jesus was very serious when he gave this command. He wasn't playing. He realized that it's hard to love your enemies. He realized that it's difficult to love those persons who seek to defeat you, those persons who say evil things about you. He realized that it was painfully hard, pressingly hard, but he wasn't playing. Anyone that has gone through something like cancer, anyone who has gone through an interpersonal challenge of cosmic proportions, anyone that's paying attention today in our world sees that there are so many opportunities to take this practice deeper, no? To take this practice deeper. And it's not easy. Martin Luther King goes on to say, Love your enemy, and remember, this is whatever it is on your heart and your mind today. Whatever it is that you keep thinking of, that only you are thinking of, because it's yours today. Whatever it is, it's all about this for you today. That's the thing, the thing that's knocking on our door. He goes on to say, love your enemies, and it's significant. He says that Jesus did not say, like your enemies. I don't like them, but Jesus says, love them. And love is greater than like. Love is understanding. Redemptive goodwill for all men so that you love everybody because God loves them. You refuse to do anything that will defeat an individual because you have agape in your soul. And here you come to the point that you love the individual. That you love the individual. That's why Jesus says, love your enemy. Eric Butterworth talks about this love. And this love that we're talking about is agape love. It is God love. It is a love that is beyond the romantic love, that is beyond reciprocal or friendly love. It is the highest form of love. It is the power that we're talking about when we talk about Charles Fillmore intuiting the 12 powers. It is part of our divine faculties that raised into highest consciousness create the experience of the Christ presence or the enlightened one, the awakened one here on earth. Eric Butterworth says, what it means that God is in man is that the Holy Spirit or the whole of spirit is within you. He says the whole of divine mind, the whole of divine love, the whole of infinite substance is in you and in focus as you at every moment in time, wherever you may be, wherever I am, God is in its entirety. Whatever else we may ultimately find the universe to be it is whole. We may not see or understand the whole, even the whole at the point where we exist. But it is whole, and in that we can feel secure. 
Nothing can be taken out of the universe and thus nothing is irrelevant or inconsequential in it. He also says that Jesus said, I and the Father are one. It is a giant idea that has been obscured because people have thought that Jesus' relationship with God was unique with him. Actually, Jesus was saying, you live in the universe and you are part within the whole. But the whole of things is also within you. There can be no separation. He goes on to say, Holy Spirit is a common term in Christianity that is rarely understood. Ministers talk about it as divine personality that comes and goes by grace or divine whim. Here is an, uh, here is an idea that if you once grasp its full import, you will lift, it will lift you to a new high awareness that you will never lose again. Wherever spirit is at all, the whole of spirit must be. And because God or spirit is omnipresent, the whole of spirit or the Holy Spirit must be present in its entirety at every point in space and time. And then he says, this is a fantastic concept. This is a fantastic concept. That means we are creators. Martin Luther King said it like this. He said, when you come to the point that you look into every man and you see what is deep down within him, what every religion called the image of God, you come to love them in spite of, no matter of, no matter what he does. You see God's image there and that is an element of goodness that he can never slough off. Discover the element of good. Discover the element of good. This agape love that Martin Luther King is talking about, he defines as purely spontaneous, unmotivated, groundless, and creative love. It is the love of God operating in the human heart. Agape is that spontaneous and uncaused kind of love that is, get this, indifferent to human merit. Can we tune in to a love that is beyond our human judgments? A love that is a power, a love that if we choose to take it on, it is the power to bless, the power to restore, the power to transform, the power to heal. It is in this love that we can be grounded. It is in this love that we can find peace and we can say in every moment, I will not let go until you bless me. It is in this love that we can receive the fullness of our power to co-create. Never sacrifice the love that is inside of you. At all costs, pursue and persevere with agape love. Martin Luther King had Plenty of reasons not to be in the presence of love, not to feel love, not to give love, not to speak about love. Plenty of reasons. But he graced this planet with a teaching that still calls us higher today, no? And he said in his sermon, he talked actually about a time where he was sitting at a table after um, getting up at night really disturbed about some hatred that it was coming his way. And, and he, he really went to the core of his practice, went to the core of his being and, and called on that love to come through him and personally to him in his life to carry him. And in this talk, he says, I love you and I would rather die than hate you. The master teacher demonstrated this. Agape love. It is our birthright. It is our inheritance. 
It is our destiny and it is our offering. Namaste.